John 15, 1 through 11. I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he purges it, that it may bear more fruit. You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, so neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. And he who abides in me, and I in him, he bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. If anything does not, if anyone does not abide in me, he's thrown away as a branch and dries up, and they gather them and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish, and it shall be done for you. By this is my Father glorified, that we may bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. Just as the Father has loved me, I have also loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments, and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be made full. Let's pray. Gracious Father, as we now turn to your word, quicken us with understanding and delight. Free us from the temptation to be distracted in our thinking. Will you help us to focus on the words of our Savior carefully and profitably. For your glory and our growth in grace, we pray in his name. Amen. Please be seated. This morning, as I proposed to you earlier, we have the opportunity to think about this concept of abiding. The word in the Greek is meno, and it's a word that, not the Greek word, but the word to abide, is found in every language. It's so basic, so elementary. We all have a concern for where we abide. And there's basically two kinds of abiding. To abide in a certain location, but also in a certain building or covering or some kind of shelter. So there's both place and property involved in the abiding that we all I think most of us, most of the time, just take for granted. Webster defines abiding as remaining steadfast, living securely, living in a dwelling place, and remaining true to something as, for instance, a commitment. In the Old Testament, this idea of abiding occurs often, of dwelling, and I will propose to you, it come, begins early in the history of the church and of the kingdom. Genesis 12, verse 1 and verse 7. We see God addressing this idea. Genesis 12. And now the Lord said to Abraham, to Abram, Go forth from your country and from your relatives, and from your father's house to the land which I will show you. Verse 7. And the Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your descendants I will give this land. So he built an altar there to the Lord who had appeared to him. So we have the idea there clearly of a land, and we often use the term the promised land as a reflection of that idea of an abiding place that's been promised. But there's also a second way of abiding that the Old Testament deals with, and that's in Psalms, especially beautifully shown. 
And that's the idea of abiding with the Lord. Psalm 15, verse 1. O Lord, who may abide in your tent? Who may dwell on your holy hill? And then you have the words that encapsulate the marks of those who abide in God's dwelling place, who dwell in his holy hill and in his tent, in his tabernacle. And I think many of you know these words. He who walks with integrity and works righteousness, speaks truth in his heart, does not slander with his tongue, nor does evil to his neighbor, nor takes up a reproach against his friend, in whose eyes a reprobate is despised, but who honors those who fear the Lord. He swears to his own hurt and does not change. He does not put out his money at interest. He does not take a bribe against the innocent. He who does these things will never be shaken, and presumably never be shaken, especially from that dwelling in the presence of God. And then Psalm 61, another reflection on that. Psalm 61, beginning with verse 4. Hear my cry, O God. Give heed to my prayer. From the end of the earth I call to you when my heart is faint. Lead me to the rock that is higher than I, for you have been a refuge for me, a tower of strength against my enemy. Let me dwell in your tent forever. Let me take refuge in the shelter of your wings. And then some wonderful words of that idea of dwelling with God in Psalm 91. Psalm 91, verses 1 and then 9 and 10. He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. And then verse 9. For you have made the Lord my refuge, even the Most High, your dwelling place. No evil shall befall you, nor shall any plague come near your dwelling. So you see the idea there of dwelling with the Lord and closeness with him is, is well laid out, and I've only picked a few of the many texts I could read to show that there was this Old Testament idea. And, of course, we know that Christ could ground everything he said on what the Old Testament said, as he quoted it often. So there's these uses that are a foundation for our understanding a relationship with God that is, as Christ unfolded it, very much primarily God-centered. Now here's a, a word of caution. If you think about it, it's interesting that Christ did not say these words till the night of his betrayal at the Last Supper. He held back on this full revelation of abiding until that night, as did he in the idea of being annexed to a vine as a branch is tied into its trunk. The illustration is simple. It's an illustration that's easy to heedlessly pass by because it's yet so profound. In the Old Testament, the idea of dwelling begins with a land. And you can begin to see there's a movement with the idea of abiding closer and closer to that of God. And in Psalm 91, we see the specificity of abiding with God clearly articulated. 
And of course, there's many other places in the Old Testament that reflect that. But Jesus Christ, I dare to propose, presents a depth of insight into dwelling and abiding that is indeed richer than anywhere else in the Old Testament and the rest of the New. So in our texts and in the some preliminary passages in John, which we read one for reflection, there's evidence that Jesus Christ was concerned to put this idea before his hearers before even the Last Supper unfolding of this marvelous concept in all its fullness. And in John 12, we see a reflection of that. Verses 44 and following. Jesus cried out and said, He who believes in me does not believe in me, but in him who sent me. And he who beholds me beholds the one who sent me. I have come as light into the world that everyone who believes in me may dwell, may not dwell in darkness, may not abide in darkness. So there's a wonderful encouragement that there is wonderful potential for moving from spiritual darkness to spiritual light. And there is no third option. Congregation of the Lord Jesus Christ. Every one of you in this room is either dwelling in the light or in darkness. Every one of you is here either abiding in Christ or not abiding in Christ. And so if you are one who believes that you have a relationship with Jesus Christ that's unto eternal life, this is for you to grow in your abiding. If, on the other hand, you suspect you are not dwelling in Christ, this is for you. To stimulate you, please God, and to encourage you to pray and without ceasing to leave the throne of grace addressed continually until you know that your heart has been granted the grace to see the kingdom, to enter the kingdom, to believe in its king, and to embrace the salvation that Jesus Christ so perfectly accomplished. So there are three abidings in this text, three specific abidings that God has brought to us through the words of his son. And the first of these is the concept we've already addressed in two texts, specifically that of abiding in Christ. Now here's an example of how we need to be careful. As I've worked on this text and thought about it, and I have for a number of years, uh, I did not, as a pastor, early preach in the Gospel of John because I considered it beyond me. I have a small mind. I'm a needy sinner. And I'm a slow learner. And I think that the depth of what Christ has to say is recorded in the Last Supper discourse is rich beyond measure and not in any deceptive way but in a way that helps us understand it. Embrace concepts that have no end of their depth. And the idea of abiding in Christ, dwelling in Christ, the idea of him dwelling in us is immeasurable. It's immeasurable, dear ones. And I believe that but for the grace of God, we have a tendency in our busy world to grow dull of heart in appreciating this remarkable privilege. And it is remarkable. Christ dwelling in us, we dwelling in him. 
And the part that I propose as an example, being careful, is that from the logical point of view, my training as a scientist before I went to seminary, is to think, well, how could you believe in Christ without first believing in his word? Because his word is what conveys the message, the message of his grace, his redeeming and sanctifying grace. Well, as I kept looking at this text, I realized Jesus Christ first addressed the issue of abiding in him in this discourse. Now, we grant you, and we've already read it in John 8, 31, 32, where Jesus said to his disciples, to those that believe on him, if you abide in my word, then you are truly disciples of mine. So there is a certain logical progression from the truth to the response to the truth. But in this discourse, he puts first this abiding in him and us being abided in by himself. So what does it mean? Well, think for a minute. When you go home, you dwell in your house. But those that are in your family, you do not dwell in, you dwell with. And in the Old Testament, the emphasis is more dwelling with God, abiding with God. But here Christ changes that prefix to in. And we saw the dismay of the Jews in responding to Christ's declaration that they had to eat his flesh and drink his blood to receive eternal life, to be connected with him, they found it offensive. So we start easily by thinking about the ways that we abide in a home. And think again about the illustration of a branch and its vine. There's a connection there that's close. It's a connection that can be only broken violently in the vine illustration. And in the idea of dwelling in a house, we take care of it, we keep it up, we acknowledge our need of a dwelling place. We see in a home a protection, a shelter. We have various concepts that we can extract from the idea of living in a house. But it gets a little more of a challenge when we think about relationships. Now. I proposed some time ago from this pulpit that if you ask women what they talk about when they get together, with few exceptions, they'll say relationships. And if you ask most men when they get together to fellowship, ask what they talk about, unless the presence of Christ is solidly in their midst, the likely subject will be sports or things or their favorite weapon or toy whatever it is. Men tend to think about things much more than do women. Women tend to think about relationships. And this is about relationship. This is hugely about relationship. And Jesus Christ is calling us to think of a relationship that's as close as a branch connected to a vine, as close as a relationship of dwelling in a house, a close as a relationship of, in some sense, eating his flesh and his blood. This takes thought to unpack it bit by bit. It includes focusing on him, thinking about him, following him, becoming his disciple, imitating him, humbling ourselves as he did, conforming ourselves to his image, thinking his thoughts after him, denying ourselves, confessing him courageously and without wavering, as he indicated in Matthew 10. So this is a journey, if you think about it, that if we get to the place that we can put our arms around the Last Supper discourse, and in this section of it, about the vine and the branches and the abiding, that it should be the beginning of a lifetime of unpacking and unfolding what it means to abide in him and have him abide in us. Sometimes the issue of 
trusting people comes up. The issue of who can I trust? Young couples tend to focus on this. And in premarital pre um, counseling, and I mentioned also previously here in this pulpit, they tend to write down expectations such as trust each other absolutely. And I propose when they write such things to, put, to say, can you see a, an expectation that will ruin your marriage? And when I propose that, they're dismayed. And I turn them, if they are dismayed, I turn them to Jeremiah 17.5 where God says through the prophet Jeremiah, cursed is the man that trusts in man. And so if you have a trust that's uncritical in another, it will be disappointed, and rightly so, because we're only to trust the Lord. And then the question arises, well, but whom can I trust? And my answer is nobody in the flesh. But for the believer, we can trust the presence of Christ in that person's heart and life. And indeed, if we take this idea of abiding seriously with us in Christ and Christ in us, please God, over time, there should be evidence of a radiant presence of Christ in our life. I would ask you a simple question. Does your countenance radiate the presence of Christ? And sometimes when I get up in the morning and look at them in the mirror and groggy from sleep, I think, how can Christ possibly radiate from such a withered, wrinkled countenance? Well, the fact is that if we're growing in grace, the older we get, the more our countenance should radiate the presence, the power, and the person of Jesus Christ. So here we have a call, really, to sanctification, rolling in holiness. Look at the text again. This is important. Verse 2. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. Cut off. And every branch in me that does bear fruit, he purges it. And if your Bible says prunes it, strike through that word, right in purge, because that's what it is in the Greek, wash. Wash with a soapy solution. This is the best illustration I can give to modern ears. Because the vine dresser in ancient times would start at the beginning of a day with a bucket of soapy water and go down the row, tenderly washing each branch and each tendril and each emerging coat cluster of grapes to get the lichens and the insects to, or the uh, mold and the insects off the, the vine and its parts. And there is no conceptual difference between pruning and taking away. They're, taking away is pruning. So it's a very precious text that's lost through a bad translation and it hides when that's translated as prunes. It hides the immense and intense care of the Father to wash us. And he noticed Christ says, three, you are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. The word is a cleansing word. And for those who are unsaved, the first focus of salvation is to be cleansed from sin, is it not? So, here we have Jesus Christ telling us that there's no bearing of fruit without abiding in the vine. Verse 4, abide in me and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine. So neither can you unless you abide in me. Verse 6, if anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away as a branch and dries up and they gather them and cast them into the fire and they are burned. You either abide or you don't abide. You either are abiding in Christ or you're not abiding in Christ. And if this morning the realization comes to you that you've not been abiding, abiding in Christ, my prayer is that you will leave no stone unturned in your prayers to be granted 
a relationship with Christ that's unto eternity, a relationship with Christ as your Redeemer in which you abide in him and he abides in you. Now, it is true that the means of abiding in him includes necessarily so abiding in his word. And again, back for a moment to John 8, 31, Jesus was saying to those Jews who had believed in him, if you abide in my word, then are you truly my disciples, and you shall know the truth. You sh the truth shall make you free. The Son is the truth incarnate. If you know the truth of the words of God, God uses that as the means by which he places in us a saving faith in Jesus Christ, a faith in which we are enabled to abide in him. So as we think about this idea of abiding in Christ, we cannot separate it from, of course, abiding in his word. And it's either or in this passage in the mind of our Redeemer. We're either in abiding in him or we're not. No middle ground. And this evening, if the Lord spares us, we will consider the words of Jesus Christ in Revelation 3 concerning lukewarmness. Another way of look, getting at this same issue that we will not trifle with holy things, that we will leave no, no, as it were, stone unturned to be confident, properly so, that we are engrafted into Jesus Christ. John 16 reminds us that it is an issue of faith. John 16 Verse 26 and 27. In that day you will ask in my name, and I do not say to you that I will request the Father in your behalf. Because the Father himself loves you, because you have loved me and have believed that I am come forth from the Father. You have believed. And Ephesians 3 summarizes it in a very helpful way, beginning with verse 14. For this reason I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every branch in heaven and on earth derives its name, that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with power through his Spirit in the inner man, clearly and abiding in him, so that Christ may dwell in your heart through faith. Christ may dwell in your heart through faith. Beloved, this is a faith issue. And the author of Hebrews puts it powerfully in Hebrews 12, 14 when he says, without sanctification no man shall see the Lord. This is a sanctification text. It's a call to a lifetime of growing in the vine and increasing in fruitfulness. But there's a second abiding, a second call to abide, and you find that in verse 7 of our text. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it shall be done for you. Christ's words are to be cherished by his disciples. What he said was intended to have eternal, redemptive, and sanctifying power. And in John chapter 8, as we read it previously. There's a condition of true discipleship is abiding in his word, a condition of knowing the truth, a condition of the truth being given to set us free. And I have come to the place in my devotions as a slow learner, where as I read through the Bible and that with my wife as well, I still each day look to a portion of the Gospels to be reminded of the words of Jesus Christ, since he puts such an emphasis on that. After all, is it not in and through Christ that I have a relationship with the Father, if at all? Is it possible to have a relationship with Christ that is not grounded carefully upon his words as well as the words he inspired in the other writers of Scripture? So treasuring the word of God is crucial. 
And hear that remarkable petition in chapter 17, verses 17 through 19, in the great high priestly prayer. He's praying to the Father for his disciples. Verse 17, sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. And I might add as a postscript that Christ clearly mingled together his own words with the words of the Father. So we're rightly to understand because he said he spoke with the Father, revealed to him that the words, if you have a Bible where it's printed in red, yes, they're of Christ, but they're also the words of the Father. And conversely, the words that are written by other writers of Scripture are to be understood as his words. Verse 18, You did send me into the world. I have also sent them into the world. And for their sakes I sanctify myself, that they, the, that they themselves also may be sanctified in truth. I sanctify myself, so that they may be sanctified. This is remarkable. And of course, a person who loves the truth and wants to be careful with Scripture can well say, how can Christ be sanctified? He's already perfect, infinitely so. Well, the Scripture tells us that he learned obedience, that he grew in stature and wisdom, that in his humanity he did indeed grow and acquire increased discernment of God's will, increased understanding of Scripture, as well as being yet divine. And so here he prays that we will grow in holiness through the Word. What a beautiful enrichment of what he said in John 15 as he concludes the time with the disciples in the upper room with his great high priestly prayer. But then there's a third abiding. And this gets even more amazing. Verse 9. Just as the Father has loved me, I have also loved you. Abide in my love. Abide in my love. Now if we're already abiding in him and abiding in his word, how does it seem possible that there can yet be another dimension of abiding? We're not going to abide in his word unless we love it. We're not going to abide in him unless we love him. And we have some sense of his love, so how can we abide in his love? Well, let me pass on to you an insight as a pastor of over 40 years that few indeed are the professing believers, believers who love the Lord and who desire to serve him and obey him and walk with him in holiness and radiate his lordship in their lives that do not, on occasion, experience fear. We all admit, if we are thinking biblically, that sin remains in us in some measure until we are translated into glory. We ref that was reflected again this morning in our prayer time. And so we clearly know that we have to put off sin and put on righteousness till the day of our last breath, that we're still engaged as soldiers of Jesus Christ using the armor of God to fight the good fight of faith. We know that. But how... Do I know that I'm truly abiding in the love of the Father and of the Son? Turn, please, to, a, my mind just went blank, blank, to 1 John 4. Thank you, Lord. 1 John 4. And I suspect many of you have this text underlined in your Bibles. Text is 1 John 4, beginning with verse 17. By this love is perfected with us, that we may have confidence in the day of judgment, 
Because as he is, so also are we in this world. As he is, so also are we. As a reflection of him abiding in us and we in him. Verse 18. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. Because fear involves punishment. And the one who fears is not perfected in love. We love because he first loved us. One of the great qualities of Charles Spurgeon's preaching was his oft reference to our inability to accomplish on our own the work of faith. He emphasized well from his own experience, I suspect, that looking unto Christ is the centerpiece of exercising faith in Christ that has effect. It has consequence. There's something tangible that we can extract from that. And in the Hebrews 12 passage where he says, setting aside every weight and the sin that so easily besets us and running with endurance the race set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, we have two great examples of tangible evidence of his love in us, setting aside every weight and sin that so easily besets us, running with patience the race that is set before us. Easy to say, not so easy to do. And if you think about it, there's a certain irony that the longer we walk in the faith, the greater becomes the potential to take it as normative and hence take it for granted. Never, never, never should we forget that being given the grace to believe in Jesus Christ is extraordinary, it's exceptional, it's supernatural, and should so be regarded every waking day. I believe a good reflection of that is when we reach the place that we get up in the morning, that somewhere early as the day begins, we thank Jesus Christ with a sense of amazement that he would love us enough to leave the courts of heaven and the glory he received there, come to this sin-cursed world, be despised and rejected of men, ultimately horribly abused and tortured and then crucified, dying an agonizing death to save us. Such love is immeasurable. And I think we do well to reflect consciously upon its amazing depth and height and breadth as a centerpiece of two things that are reflected in this text in John 4. One is what we might call redemptive fear, having confidence in the day of judgment, not being fearful of Christ's coming, a good evidence if he were to appear this afternoon, could you say in truth to yourself and to your Redeemer, I am not afraid for you to come? Is there a readiness there in your own heart to say, Lord Jesus, I'm ready to meet you today if you call me or if you appear? But then there's a second fear, and that's often a fear of circumstances or when we're in a difficult situation and especially and particularly in persecution. One of your dear members here introduced me to a book I had not known about called The Scots Worthies. And my high-tech wife showed mercy to her low-tech husband, me, in ordering from Amazon a copy of the Scots Worthies. And in it, there are the, some remarkable tales of godly men, and many of them pastors, in Scotland during the First and Second Reformation in Scotland. And one of the most remarkable aspects of that book is reading records, if you can believe this, records of the discourse of 
godly men as they were dying, if they weren't, or even when they were being ready to be hung or have their head chopped off or dying in their own bed, the discourse of these godly men concerning their trust in Christ after a life of godly service, but their trust being entirely in the merits and the work of Jesus Christ. Absolutely beautiful. And facing without fear the hangman's noose, the executioner's guillotine, which they used in Scotland many times. And doing so without terror gripping their hearts. Have you ever felt fear of acknowledging you were a Christian when you were in a group that was clearly secular and ungodly? Have you ever been tempted to lowball your testimony, to fly under the radar? Well, that's included and certainly a focus of the fear that is cast out by the perfect love of God. It's not our love for God that's in view here in 1 John 4. It's God's love for us. So it's not only an invitation to abide in Christ, to abide in his word, it's an invitation to abide in the ocean of his immeasurable love. The ocean of his immeasurable love. His love enables us to love others, which is one of the things that we sometimes fear. John 13, 34, a new commandment I, have to, I give to you, that you love one another even as I have loved you, that you also love one another as I have loved you. You love one another. What, Lord? You expect me to love that spouse that dumped me, that person that cheated me, that person that persecuted me, the one that treated me so badly. In other words, Lord, you really want me to love my enemies? And our Savior says, yes. By this all men will know you, that you are my disciples, if you have love one for another. So, beloved, it's a love that delivers us from fear and from that which would paralyze us, and in such a deliverance also delivers us from pride. That's one of the great helps to overcoming the ever-present potential of that serpent of pride to rise within our hearts and to bite us where we least expect it and to cause us to dishonor and grieve our Savior. So what are some of the benefits of this glorious abiding that Christ has called us to embrace? Well, if you look at verse 8, he says, By this is my Father glorified that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. Two results there. Bearing of much fruit, and glorifying the Father in that bearing of fruit. It's a validation of our relationship when we bear fruit for Christ and for the Father. Verse 7, another benefit again. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish, and it shall be done for you. When we abide in Christ and in his words, God is sovereignly pleased to hear our petitions and prayers when we abide in Christ, when Christ abides in us. Chapter 16, verse 23. And in that day you will ask me no questions. Truly, truly, I say to you, if you shall ask the Father for anything, he will give it to you in my name. We will receive grace to keep his commandments. Verse 10. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, 
just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. Verse 5, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him, he bears much fruit, for apart from me you can do nothing. Apart from Jesus Christ, we cannot bear one shriveled grape, if you will, using that figure. Apart from Christ, we cannot so bear fruit. In Christ, we can bear fruit abundantly, and as long as we walk the face of this earth, we should do so. Sometimes, in dealing with people living in retirement communities, I have been asked, Pastor, what can I do for Jesus? And I said, you can pray. What can I do for the church? You can pray. You can bear fellow believers up as a warrior, a prayer warrior. You have the time to do it. Use it well. May God grant that the day that God takes us home, if he allows us to be aware of that, that prayer for others is still on our lips. And if God gives us the grace and the privilege of dying in our bed with loved ones around us, may he give us the grace to minister to them with words of love and exhortation and encouragement to the very last. Obeying his word, not a trifle. Verse 14, you are my friends if you do what I command you. God will enable us in bearing fruit to believe and to receive the label of friends, not just servants or slaves. And there's many more that I could mention, but there's two I want to close with in chapter 17. Verses 20 through 23. I do not ask on behalf of these alone, Christ here praying to the Father. In other words, I'm not just praying for the disciples here, but for those who believe in me through their word. That includes you and me. That includes us. This all applies to us that they may all be one, even as you, Father, are, are in me and I in you. That they also may be in us, that the world may believe that you did send me. And the glory which you have given me, I have given to them, that they may be one just as we are one, and I in them and you in me, that they may be perfect in unity, so that the world may know that you did send me and did love them even as you did love me. In proclaiming these truths, I find that the sense of inadequacy overwhelms me at times to try to encapsulate in mere words as an old retired preacher this love of God that embraces us, sanctifies us, enables us to believe, enables us to love in return, and to prepare our hearts to bathe in the full expression of his love when we enter into glory. May God give us the grace to jealously seek to abide in Christ that he may abide in us, to abide in his word and to abide in his love. I remind you in the opening sermon of his public ministry, the, what's called the Sermon on the Mount, that he said at the end of it, many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, didn't we do thus and so? And he says, he said that he would say to them, depart from me, you accursed, into everlasting torment. I know you not. I do not know you. Abiding in Christ and Christ in him is the antithesis of that terrifying rejection where Christ is saying, I want to dwell in you. I want you to dwell in me. May we treasure that amazing word, abide. Let's pray. Father, we're weak and feeble. 